Uh, okay, and you know, usually I'm covering this, yeah, you know, as a, a reporter for PW, but no more, not this time. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, I'm del I'm here, and I'm, I'm delighted uh, to present Jim with the Sally uh, D. Decker Award uh, for Lifetime Service. Uh, this award acknowledges uh, and rewards the tireless and persistent efforts, often unseen, uh, of an individual working on behalf of the book trade, the book industry. Um, there's no better example of that than Jim Milley. Uh, and I know, because he's, I've worked beside him. He's been my boss, my colleague, a good friend. Uh, wow. Let's just say a couple of decades. Uh, and uh, there's just no better way to describe him than that mission statement. Uh, it reflects his leadership, uh, his impact on Publishers Weekly, uh, uh, as much as his broader impact and his influence uh, and service to the industry. In my opinion, and probably so at these, the table over there too, from PW, he's the best book industry reporter, editor, analyst, you, fig you, you, you figure out something else I've ever had the privilege to work with. He's always in demand. He's always in a meeting. Uh, he seems to just always be available uh, when you need him. Uh, his skills, his reach, his commitment to the book industry uh, make him a popular and indispensable colleague. Obviously, he's on committees here at BISG. He's been on boards. Um, uh, but I first met him, I don't even know if you remember this, Madeline Reuter introduced me to me at some book. It might even been a BSG meeting. I don't know. At some event, uh, this is in the mid '80s or something. You were at BP Report, and you can you can ask him about BP Report uh, yourself. But Madeline Reuter, who was a news editor at PW for many years and who hired me, uh, so he was a competitor when I first met him. Uh, there he joined PW under the legendary Fred Sporn. Uh, and of course, he's gone on to have many duties. He's the news editor, PW Daily editor. He's what is he? Your senior VP and editorial director now. Uh, but this long and for, for formidable list of duties doesn't really quite capture the full range of his leadership at PW. His energy, his reliability, uh, and just how he works to get things done uh, under a deadline pressure. So he's in a lot of meetings. Uh, he's dealing with statistics, events, uh, you know, personnel better. He's the editorial director, uh, uh, but he's also the publishing wonk in chief. Uh, he's the data guy. He's the, the business reporter in, in chief. Uh, and believe me, uh, I, I'm always thankful for that, for the business articles I had to write that he had to edit and, you know, get them through. Uh, and he's also a kind of editorial therapist in chief. Uh, I mean, back in the days when we actually had offices, uh, um, you know, it wasn't, it's never, it was never unusual to see a stream of people heading into Jim's office. Uh, he was in conference or imprisoned, you, be, be, you, you could decide, um, working out some complex personal business issue, whatever, some sort. But he, those are his skills, that's, that's his personality, that's his character, uh, and it's been very impressive to watch him and transition through some of the most dramatic changes in the industry. And I'm gonna end with a, just a quick antidote. A couple of years ago, um, we all got together in the news department. It was me, Andrew Albanese, Rachel Deal, it might've been someone else, I think this was before John Mayer came, and we got him a helmet. We got him a New York Giants helmet signed by Ahmad Bradshaw and uh, Brandon Jacobs to when giants walk the earth. Um, and I think when I gave it to you, I told you at the time is that, you know, I hope you enjoy this. You're the best boss I ever had and I'm never gonna say that to you again because you don't want the ego to get out of control. Well, thanks to BISG, I'm gonna have to go back on that. Uh, congratulations on getting this reward. Uh, you're a great colleague, a good buddy, and you're the best boss I ever had. So, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you, thank you.
uh, I'm not sure I can follow that. So, uh, um, but yeah, I had a great, that's a great introduction, Calvin. Um, I couldn't come from a better guy. Um, as Calvin said, we've known each other for roughly 30 years. Um, and he's also a, a legend in his own way. Um, many of you probably know that he retired a few months ago when we put the note in. We got literally hundreds of um, messages of talking about his leadership in bringing comics and graphic novels into the book world. Um, if, if many people aren't aware of that, I mean, it's true. Calvin was an early believer in comics and graphic novels. He had a role in getting New York Comic Con done. Um, I think it's fair to say we review and report on graphic novels pretty much more than anybody. And despite as many efforts, Calvin, I have never read a graphic novel. <laughs> but maybe I'll try. <laughs> um, this award means a great deal to me, uh, especially uh, for, for two reasons. Uh, the Sally D. Decker Award, obviously. I mean, I knew Sally pretty well, especially in her, her years there where she was doing um, the programming for Book Expo. Uh, I remember one year sitting outside Javits, kind of smirking at Javits, I guess, and kind of wondering, how can we make this show better? Um, you know, she was brainstorming a lot of ideas. Um, I never remember coming up with anything that actually we could use, but it was always fun. And she always did it with a lot of energy, and you could really see how much she cared about it all, and also how much she cared about BISG, um, which is another thing we had in common. And BISG has been an important in my career here too. When I, I first joined, when Fred Zipporin hired me, and I thank him to this day, um, I was put on the statistic committee under the great Sandy Paul. Um, so, and over the years, uh, I got involved with doing the trends reports, which I don't think you do anymore, right? Um, I think all those forecasts never really worked out quite well, but we tried. Um, and over the years, worked with some other great uh, executive directors. I see Michael Healy's here. Um, Jeff Abraham was, I think, one of the first ones uh, I also worked with. And I don't know if Angela was actually ever executive director or were you an interim executive director. So worked with her too. We worked on a great project, which I don't really remember what it was about. It was right when the ebooks started coming out, and we're trying to get a sense on where they were going, what they were doing, what formats were the most popular. Um, and I worked on it with our art director and uh, Angela sets a high bar. So I come back to Clive and I say, Clive, Angela says we have to change this. And he would just like kind of roll his eyes and say, okay. So then every time I said, well, Angela, he goes, oh no. <laughs> but it, it, the project came out great and we all appreciated it. Um, so when I realized I was the winner uh, of this award, it was a very pleasant surprise. You know, every year, you know, Brian's emails I saw were saying, you know, you know, can you write up this year's winner? So, you know, I saw the email come in. And I thought, yeah, okay. So I scanned it and I saw my name and I kept scanning it some more and I said, well, who won? Um, <laughs> so then I had to go back and uh, uh, I double checked and Brian did ensure me that I was the winner. So thank you for that. And, um, you know, I accept this award on behalf of everyone at PW, because it's really a team effort. And it means a lot to everyone there to know that what you're doing is appreciated. You know, the nature of journalism, um, most of the time when you get feedback, it's because people are complaining about something. Um, so it, it's nice to, to be thanked uh, for doing our job and to know that our job has value. Um, and I'd like to think of this award that might have something to do with our coverage of the early days of the pandemic. Um, we wrote more stories in those early months when so much was uncertain, nobody knew what was gonna happen then, at any time I was there uh, with the company. And we did have people come up and thank us for those things. And I remember following the weekly book scan numbers and the first weeks they were all down, down and down. And then all of a sudden uh, they started going up it must have been because Amazon stopped just shipping essential toy, uh, toys, essential products and moved on to other things. But then this friend of mine kept saying, so when are they gonna go back down? When are they gonna go back down? And thankfully they didn't go down for, I guess two and a half years. So, um, and when we started at PW uh, 30 years ago, 
my, my goal was to, you know, to write stories that would help all parts of publishing and all parts of publishing succeed, much like the mandate here of BISG. And even though PWs always believe, even though we are called Publishers Weekly, I've always believed that we report on all aspects of the business and not necessarily take sides. I remember early on, Ingram was in a dispute with, I think it was Bantam. I don't exactly remember what the dispute was about. But once it got resolved, you had an Ingram um, executive come up to me and said, well, we'd like to thank you for being fair. And I said, well, you know, why would we not be fair? He goes, well, your publisher's weekly. Um, so, you know, while we do love publishers, we are very keenly aware that there's an entire risk, an ecosystem to think of to make this industry a success. Last year, PW celebrated its 150th anniversary. I know from many of my 30 years there, it's taken a lot of effort to stay in business that long when your centerpiece is a print magazine. Not to say that we haven't changed over the years. Today, PW still has a print edition with some 20,000 subscribers. We publish nine or 10 news newsletters, depending on the, the week. We have about 172,000 email subscribers, a website that draws over a million users a month with almost 2 million monthly page views, some 1.3 million social media followers. So, you know, uh, the print pro uh, product isn't what is vibrant. Uh, not, well, I shouldn't say vibrant. Sorry, George. Um, <laughs> It uh, doesn't reach as many people as it used to. PW as an entity reaches more people than ever. But being in business for 151 years means we've had some ownership changes over the years. Many here might know we were owned by Reed Elsevier's Reed Business Information Subsidiary until one day somebody at Reed woke up and say, oh, the internet is here, we don't want to publish trade magazines anymore. Um, those last few years at Reed were, were very painful. But something good came out of it. Reed sold Publishers Weekly to George Slowick, who has now owned it for 12 years. George had been a publisher of PW just prior to my arrival and had left to do a number of things in uh, the magazine space as looking, and was looking for a new opportunity when PW went up for sale. No one believes more in the PW brand or the future of PW than George. Another key figure in keeping PW moving forward is Kevin Breyerman. Now, I'm sure Kevin has tried to sell most people in this room either an advertisement uh, or a sponsorship. But without his tireless efforts, I'm not sure what PW would be today. And just so I do my duty, the U.S. Book Show is three weeks away. And Kevin, is there anything anybody here can, you know, take a part of? Okay. All right. Um, Let's see. And also, of course, uh, I'd like to thank all my tables who, who made it here today. Um, Callum gave a great shout out to uh, some of the folks who are here. And also, I'd like to thank the people back at the office um, who are working to finish this week's uh, edition. I mean, most of them really aren't in the office, they're home, but you know, we know how that goes this, this, uh, in this environment. And as I said, publishing is really, a, publishing all the content we do is really a team effort. We couldn't do it without everybody here. Um, publishing industry, the publishing industry is the only business I've ever been in, and I don't think I could have done it if it wasn't a terrific business. It's been fun to cover, full of smart people who believe in the power of books. Now, it's fashionable to criticize publishing for its many foibles. We have done it occasionally ourselves. But at the core, it's full of good people trying to do the right thing. And I appreciate your acknowledging our commitment to doing what is right for the industry. Thanks. There's so many. It's a very rowdy crowd at PW. <laughs> There's so many folks from PW that we're actually sending the photographer to them. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'd like to invite Angela Boll to come up to introduce Phil Maddens. Hello. 
nice to be here. Uh, I'm Angela Bull. I'm the 90-day-old new CEO of the Firebrand Group, which is a collection of companies that includes Firebrand Technologies, NetGalley, and Superdoo. And an old hat at BISG. It's really nice to be back on a BISG stage, a place that will always feel like home to me. And it's for an outstanding reason to honor and introduce this year's recipient of BISG's Industry Champion Award, Phil Maddens. Hachette Book Group's Executive Director of Digital Publishing Technology. Now, the first time that I met Phil Maddens was in a BISG committee, like we all, where we all meet everybody. It was the Identification Committee or the Metadata Committee or uh, EDI Committee because BISG has a very nuanced way of naming their committees. So you know exactly what you're gonna get when you walk in the room. I was 24 or maybe 25, and I was hired as the administrative assistant to the executive director, Jeff Abraham. And it was my first job that didn't include dropping a pitcher of beer at a table. So I was very nervous about how it was going to be to be in the professional book publishing industry. And I was enamored by everything books. Uh, I found myself persistently, and in, some of you knew me back then, so you'll know that it's true, I was persistently running into walls in my eagerness to understand the complicated nature of the book publishing industry and just leave some kind of impression on the world of books as books had already left such an indelible impression on me. Phil must have taken pity on the walls, that's what I think, because it wasn't long before he and others at the time, like the great Tom Clarkson, Wendell Lotz, and Joe Ganella, and my boss, Jeff Abraham, of course, began mentoring me in very subtle ways. Phil would provide a kind redirect. He would invite a thoughtful line of questioning, an interesting observation about how consensus is driven and walls are, for the most part, avoided. And many of us are familiar with the kind of person who can call themselves a mentor, but really just push their opinion on you and push and push and push until you either agree with them or you just move to the next table or the next town or the next industry. Uh, basically just avoid them, and that was never Phil. And this award, the BISG Industry Champion Award, given to someone whose efforts have advanced the publishing industry as a whole, honors this kind nature, which is important to say continues today. So we would just ask Nick Rourke, who's here, the Director of Publishing Products at Hachette, and a fellow mentee of Phil's. This is from Nick. Nick says, quote, Phil was the first person who was able to easily explain the crazy process of book publishing in one sitting. His extensive knowledge of every major tech transition in the industry gives him the ability to operate at the 6,000 foot view or the six foot view, you pick. And Ashet has been better positioned for every database migration, system integration, and publisher acquisition because Phil's part of the team. Additionally, Phil's been a true friend and mentor to me since the second I joined Ashet and a great deal of my success in the industry I owe directly to Phil. His passion, his selflessness, and his expertise are unmatched, and I couldn't think of someone more deserving of BISG's Industry Champion Award. So thank you, Nick, for those. But luckily, Phil's ability to advance publishing industry isn't just about bringing up the next generation of book publishing executives, which is true, he does that. Phil's actual work in the industry is also meaningful. So Terry Adams at Hachette, Hachette's VP of Digital and Paperback Publisher explains, it's totally fitting that Phil is, at VISG has chosen Phil to receive the Industry Champion Award. Phil sees around corners and leads all of us who work in book publishing to where we need to be. For example, some things Phil has done at Hachette, um, I gathered some of these from Hachette's SVP and Senior Information Officer, Mike Blanco. First, Mike says, quote, Phil's an evangelist for the importance of the role that data quality plays in a seamless, error-free publishing process. Which I have to pause and say is the most BISG sentence I have ever read <laughs> and is so appropriate. So thank you, Mike, for that. And Mike goes on, Phil's early contributions to the creation of first Hachette's digital asset management system and later the automation of Hachette's ebook creation process sets the stage for digital trans transformation at Hachette Book Group. So a major legacy of Phil's is the digital transformation of Hachette Book Group. It's quite a legacy. And finally, from Mike, quote, Phil is a font of information for both historical and leading edge publishing processes. He is the commensurate mentor for new IT employees 
and always willing to take on new and uncharted responsibilities. In addition to all of that, Phil is just one heck of a nice guy. So please join me in congratulating and welcoming to the podium Phil Maddens of a Shep Book Group and this year's recipient of BISG's Industry Champion Award, one heck of a nice guy. out of my hands. Okay. I'm a little verklempt now. Um, uh, thank you, Angela, for that, for that lovely introduction, and thank you, Mike and Nick, and I'll thank Terry later for those, those, those lovely words. I'm really, really very touched and highly embarrassed. Um, you know, Angela, you know, working with you and getting to know you during that time in BISG was, was, was really a joy, and don't downplay the work that you did there. You really led BISG, you, you, you ran the committees, you made them work, you made them deliver, you herded the cats uh, like no one else could. And, and the work we did together, it's really a big reason why I'm standing here today. So thank you and congrats again on the new gig at Firebend, best of luck. And the best part about that for me is that we get to work together again. Okay. Okay, so I wanna thank Brian and the BISG board for this recognition. I'm thrilled and honored to be included in the roster of BISG industry champions. Thank you to my Hashtag book group colleagues who give their, uh, uh, who, for their support here today and every day. And to all of my colleagues who give their time and energy to BISG committee work. Hashtag's longstanding commitment to BISG and many, many other industry organizations is a great source of pride for us. And of course, thank you to all of the incredible people I have met and worked with in BISG over the years. You have helped me and taught me so much. I always say that whatever I have contributed to BISG pales into comparison to what I've taken away. Um, I also wanna thank my family, my, my lovely wife, Laura, who's here today, honey. Um, And our children, Jillian and Michael, and our future daughter-in-law, Nicole, we've had a lot of good news in the past month or two. Uh, Laura's my soulmate, my best friend, and most recently, my acceptance speech editor. Uh, and she's valiantly listened to me rant, my rants about this business during our 34 years together. I don't know how many times she's heard me say, that's it, I'm done. But she's always patiently talked me down, and I'm grateful for that. In truth, I haven't stuck around publishing for 40 years because I enjoy aggravation. Um, and yes, I do know, I, I do know I look like it's 40 years. <laughs> I've done so because I love helping to bring new books into the world. I'm a lifelong reader and book lover, and I can think of no better way to spend my professional life. I love this industry. I'm proud to be part of it. And I'm proud that this industry will always stand up as it is doing today to any and all who threaten to take our books away from us and our children, our bookstores, our libraries, and our schools, more power to that. When Brian let me know that I was going to get this award and that I would be making a speech about it, he suggested I reflect back on why I got it so involved in BISG and what it means to me. So in order to do that, I do have to go back to some of my history in publishing. When I was younger, I only thought about getting into publishing as a published author. That was my goal and my dream. I had just gotten a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing, and since I could go no further academically with it, I had to get a job, a real job, to support myself and my writing. With the MFA, it really only qualified me for two things, teaching college English or going into publishing. It happened to be a bad year for college English teachers that year. And also I figured, you know, in publishing, I can get a lot more free books. So 
Lori Stark, who many of you may know from her many contributions to BISG and to Penguin Random House, was the managing editor at Crown at the time, and she hired me to be her editorial assistant. And if Lori, if you're out there listening, thank you for giving me my start. You know, without you, I wouldn't be standing here. Um, now at Crown, when I, uh, it was really at Crown that I first got interested in technology and really started down what would become my career path. Part of my job, this was back in 1983, was to create, update, and maintain the Crown publishing schedule. Now I did this on an IBM Selectric typewriter with a pair of scissors, scissors, scotch tape, and whiteout. When books moved, pub months, or list positions, I would literally cut them out of the, from one part of the list and paste them into the other part of the list. <laughs> Could imagine how, how enjoyable that was. Now, pub schedules were considered the Bible in those days. They probably still are. Um, and they had, they had all of the information that was entered into the mainframe systems. They went into the catalogs, title cards, jackets, advertisements, sales and marketing materials. And keeping this schedule up to date was a painstaking work. But it, and it had to be right. And by the way, this was really my first um, experience with metadata maintenance. I wouldn't call it that for several years after that, but that's really what it was. And also, when you think about it, this paper pub schedule was in itself a title management system, a very analog title management system, but a title management system all the same. And that was my first of very many <laughs> title management systems. But then Crown crawled into the digital age. One day, a brand new word processing system was delivered. It was about the size of an ice cream freezer, it came with the dual eight inch floppy drives, 16K of RAM, a tiny monochrome character-based monitor, and an attached printer that sounded like a, like a car with major transmission problems. But it changed my life. That word processor got, got my work done in a fraction of the time. It was a revelation to me. It was like the discovery of fire and the wheel all rolled into one. Technology had freed me from that awful dreaded arts and crafts project. It made my life easier. And I saw the promise. I was hooked and never looked back. From then on, in whatever position I've held, I've looked for opportunities for technology to make my life easier still and to help others do the same. And you know, the most important lesson I learned along the way, it takes a whole lot of very hard work to make your life easier but it is worth it. After I was volunteered to join BISG, a story in itself, it didn't take long for me to, to realize that BISG was the kindred spirit. BISG is in the business of making life easier. Whether we're talking about EDI or barcodes or ISPAN 13 or metadata onyx or IDing digital products, BISAC and other subject categories, work identifier, name identifiers, rights, manufacturing, shipping label standards, strict on sale date policies, EPUB, fixed layout format ebooks, accessibility, workflow, and I'm sure I'm leaving other things out. BISG is dedicated to make the industry's life easier and better. It, and it, it is a very, it, it is a lot of very hard work by a lot of very smart and dedicated people, but it, it is so worth it. Now, BISG can do that work because all sectors of the industry are represented. In an industry of this size and scope, you can only solve problems if you can understand them from all viewpoints. Otherwise, you're just going to get partial solutions and they're not going to work. At BISG, not only can we learn what each sector of the, of the industry does and how each sector works, but, and I think more importantly, why each sector, op sector operates the way it does. You must know the why before, oops, sorry, before you can come up with any solution that will work and last. A solution that will keep all of the links in the supply chain connected and working together. It is this industry-wide perspective that has kept me working in this organization for all these years. It is the way. Now, as you heard this morning, there is work to be done. We have, the, we have the foundation for sure. We have robust standards. The supply chain chugs along, communications happen. And thank goodness for that. I mean, can you imagine what would have happened to this industry during the pandemic if we didn't have this framework in place? 
Would we even have an industry left after that? And thanks to the work of organizations like BISG and Editor, ISO, NISO, the W3C, the library organizations, and others, we survived and even thrived. We thought up creative new ways to market our books digitally and keep the supply chain moving and gain new skills in doing so. We set off down new, in new directions, which we continue to explore and which we need to continue to support and improve. We were also made aware of the flaws that need to be addressed. We know what doesn't work, and we know what needs to be better. That's what this morning was about. How can we become less wasteful, faster, more effective? How can we get more books into the hands of more readers? So how do we get there? Here, we get there right here at BISG. What you heard this morning was how interdependent all aspects of this business have become. We are all in this together and we need to work together, all of us, IT, operations, and the business. We are all in the same business. We, can, we can't separate IT and the supply chain from publishing and editorial or marketing and publicity or rights or any of the other parts of this business as we did in the days of mainframes and paper pub schedules. Where we are siloed, we need to tear down those silos. Yes, I say tear them down, Mr. O'Leary, tear them down. <laughs> As someone who has, has been involved in metadata my entire career, it won't, come, won't be surprising when I say it all comes back to the data. That same metadata, metadata I typed onto, onto those pub schedules 40 years ago, plus a lot more since then. But we must treat this data as the essential business asset that it is. Data is how every link of the supply chain is connected right down to the end consumer. The data, first of all, it must exist, it has to be there, and it must be accurate. That's why we have standards, that's what standards are for, to clear, for clear unencumbered communication. But the standards must be used and they must be respected because everyone needs to be speaking the same language. And that's what, we need to, that's what we need to drive to. Now, if you're wondering why I'm carrying on like this, well, I'm trying to champion the industry here. Okay. It's my job now. <laughs> Thing is, it's going to take more than one industry champion to get this work done. We need everyone to be an industry champion. Now, to me, everyone in this room is already an industry champion because you are here today. And we need you. We need everyone. We need more than everyone who is in this room today. And that's what we have to do. Now, if uh, this morning, you know, we were talking about how you get started with this. You know, if you join committees, yes, you can join committees or you can take advantage of BISG's extensive educational events and webinars. Reach out to the committee chairs or the members, reach out to Brian or Jonathan, or even reach out to me. One thing you'll notice about a lot of us, and I know a lot of people in this room who I, who, I, who I know this is true of, we really like to talk about this stuff <laughs> at any time of the day or night. You know, I once read a definition of standards organization. It, uh, the definition was, it's, it's a group of smart people sitting around arguing. And this is very true. But you know, an argument now and then, it can be very good for the soul. So thank you again for this wonderful, for this wonderful award. I will never forget it. And uh, thank you. And one more thanks to our chief industry champion, Brian O'Leary.
Linda Secondary is so happy about the new logo on this on the, the awards. Uh, I'd like to invite Andrew Savickas to come up and introduce Heteris. Since 2014, the BISG Board of Directors has presented its Industry Innovator Award uh, to an organization that boldly reimagines what publishing is and what it can be. Uh, recent recipients of BISG's Industry Innovator Award have included Wattpad, Bookshop.org, Macmillan Learning, LitBar, Little Free Library, Project Cicero, and She Writes Press. This year, the board honors Heteris for its commitment to building write once, read many workflows that support multiple downstream use cases, including those meant for print disabled audiences. The company's ability to bring leading edge single source workflow solutions to publishers of all sizes at a cost that benefits those publishers is admirable and worth recognizing. Their approach ensures that the book publishing industry is ready to meet new demands for formats and distribution methods. It also provides publishers with an easy way to take risks on smaller works while helping publishing staff rediscover the joys, not just the aggravation of working on books. I had the privilege of working with Heteris founder Nellie McKesson more than 10 years ago at O'Reilly Media where she stood out for her intelligence, insight and enthusiasm. I am delighted, though not at all surprised, to be here honoring her work as a true innovator in our industry. Please join me in uh, honoring Heteris and, and her Heteris founder, Nellie McKesson, for the Industry Innovator Award. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to keep this relatively short. I'm sure we all have email to check. <laughs> uh, I've been talking about single source workflows for a long time. Um, some of you may have seen me speak at the early TOC conferences about making books with HTML and CSS, uh, not just accessible ebooks, but print layouts as well. Um, I, I've been very lucky to find this niche that suited me so well uh, very early in my career. Um, I've also been very lucky to work with amazing organizations like O'Reilly uh, and Macmillan um, and to have the guidance of trailblazers in the single source um, space like Andrew uh, and like Dave Kramer, who's out here somewhere from Hachette. <laughs> um, I founded Heteris uh, with the goal of bringing together everything that I've learned from uh, my past experiences um, to try to offer a single source tool to not just the big five publishers who can afford to hire a, a tech team, but also smaller publishers who don't have those same resources, but need that same kind of innovation to make their company more agile. Uh, a theme from this morning um, was looking back at where we were 10 years ago um, and it, it's, it's funny to do that uh, when we're talking about single source workflows because um, while the technology has improved quite a bit and I like to think that Heteris is uh, contributing to that improvement, um, we really haven't seen a big jump in adoption of single source workflows beyond those big publishers. And there are a lot of good reasons for that. Um, I started my career as a production editor, so I know very intimately <laughs> how books are made. Um, it's a skilled process and I'm not gonna pretend like technology can just take away all of that required skill. Um, a lot of smaller publishers are also working on razor thin margins. Um, and um, the, the production teams there have so many projects on their plate that finding the time to experiment with something new or build out some new tech workflow is just asking too much. Um, so with Heteris, uh, we are trying our best to remove a lot of those roadblocks um, to make this technology accessible to smaller publishers and larger publishers as well. And to try and bring some joy back to that book production process, 
Um, so it's not just uh, sending emails to vendors back and forth. Um, it means so much to me to have the BISG recognize not just the work we're doing at Heteris, which is often very hard work, um, but also the concept of single source publishing as well and the importance that it brings to um, the publishing industry. Um, so I'd like to thank the BISG. Um, I also, I'm talking a lot about myself, but I do have a team um, and Heteris would not be possible without the contribution of every single person who has worked with me in the past and works with me now. Um, so we've got a few people here. We've got John Bylander, uh, Zach Schwartz, Tiffany Watson, um, who are all in attendance today. Um, so again, uh, I'd like to thank you for this award. Um, and I look forward to working with you guys in the future. <laughs>